Life is all about embracing the challenge, as everybody here knows. Every day, our lab brings together some of the world's leading environmental scientists to try to figure out how to get a ball round a group of people without using our hands. We've figured out what you've got to do is you hold the ball on the frisbee, you then throw the ball up in the air, you throw the frisbee to the next person who catches the frisbee and then catches the ball in the frisbee without ever using their hands. This game, this is actually its launch date, is called Frisball, and it's unbelievably addictive because it's really challenging. The failures can be catastrophic, and it means that it's the most addictive thing we've got. But when we get lost in the game and something just clicks, and it all starts to work, those failures pale in comparison to the true glory of success. I always have thought this, thought this obsession with games was why I actually struggled in university. And when I was kicked out of class at the end of my first year, a class of 300 people, I thought it was the end of my degree. But the professor took me aside and asked, why bother? Why study ecology if you're not even going to try? And I described, I've always been obsessed with biodiversity how life arose on the planet remains the greatest mystery of all time, let alone how it diversified across the world. But I simply can't keep up. I'm dyslexic on top of that, and I refuse to waste my time reading boring books when I could be enjoying life with my friends and playing games. And he gave me the simplest bit of advice ever. He said, if you enjoy ecology, why not make ecology your next game? He said, you don't need to be smarter, you don't even need to try harder. If you just embrace the challenge just like you would a game, not only are you way more likely to succeed, but you'll literally be enjoying your life anyway, so who cares if you fail? And I realize it sounds really simple and really obvious, but it had an incredibly profound impact on me. And eight years later, I'm now still studying global biodiversity. And in fact, I'm studying one of the greatest threats facing biodiversity in climate change. This is no longer a personal challenge that I need to overcome. It's a challenge to try to find solutions that can engage everyone so that they can start to have a tangible impact. Because the atmosphere that we're dealing with is actually really, really thin. It's analogous to the width of the rubber on a balloon. And every year we emit about 10 gigatons of carbon. That's carbon, not carbon dioxide, which is almost three, time, well, three times heavier. 10 gigatons of carbon into that space. That's 27,000 Empire State Buildings of carbon, and some goes into the land, some goes into the ocean, but a large chunk of it remains in the atmosphere, and it's happening every year, so we're gradually building up atmospheric carbon, which is obviously warming the planet. As such, since the start of the Industrial Revolution, we've increased that burden by about 300 gigatons. Obviously, cutting emissions with technological solutions is an absolute priority if we're going to stop climate change. But if we're going to capture that 300 gigatons, we need an immensely powerful system. And the most powerful system we've got to date is the natural system. This is a beautiful NASA simulation of the carbon cycle, where you can see carbon dioxide movement throughout the year. And we're starting the early parts of the year. And you see red colors indicating high concentrations at the start. But as we tick on into spring and then summer, we see these concentrations fade. And that's caused by one thing. It's the emergence of leaves on trees. Such a simple ecological process that every single one of us is aware of is one of many massive fluxes that balance one another out to entirely regulate our climate. Given the massive scale of this system, managing these ecosystems effectively has to be among our best chances in the fight against climate change. But until now, it's never been a scientific solution or a tangible solution that you'd invest in because it's always been the happy, clappy solution. Plant a tree, save the world, we've all heard it before. And that's because we've never had a quantitative understanding of what's possible. Project Drawdown is a brilliant organization that lists the top climate change solutions with effective refrigeration management at the top of the list with the potential to save 24 gigatons of carbon. That's 89 gigatons of carbon dioxide by 2050. If we pre prevent our meat consumption, we could save 18 gigatons by 2050. But global restoration, we have no quantitative understanding, so it's broken up into little parts that are listed way down on the list. Who's really going to spend their valuable time and money on this climate change solution until we have any quantitative understanding of what those impacts would be. Well, the real challenge here is because the Earth's massive. 
Generating that quantitative understanding is difficult. So we've relied heavily on things like satellites, which have great global coverage. They tell us about the entire world, but they can't see what's going on below, below that canopy surface. So until recently, we thought there was about 400 billion trees on the planet, which seems nice. And it was the basis for the UN's billion tree campaign to restore a billion trees. But ultimately, we knew that to get a real handle on it, we needed quantitative information. We needed a new generation of models built from the ground up on raw data, where we had millions of locations around the world where simply people had stood on the ground counting trees and estimating how big they are and estimating which species they are. And with all of those pieces of information, we can now use machine learning and artificial intelligence to fill in the gaps based on global variations in temperature and moisture and topographic information to generate the first really quantitative models of global tree density, revealing interesting patterns across the globe. But ultimately, it shows that the Earth is actually home to about 3 trillion trees. That's seven or eight times more than the previous estimate and really shows the scale of this system. Because now that we know where the trees are, we also know their size. So we can see that there's about 450 gigatons of carbon stored in those forests. But those models are great. They don't just show us where trees exist now. By characterizing which environments support trees, we can also understand where trees could naturally exist if humans weren't a factor. And we see there's room for vastly more forests across our planet. Now, obviously, most, much of this land is already forested. And loads of it is used for agricultural practices and urban practices that we, of course, need as a growing human population. But when we remove those land use types, we're left with something incredible. These are the 0.9 billion hectares of degraded land that exist across the world, places where trees would naturally exist, but they don't because of human activity, even though we're not extensively using these lands. These locations are the potential for massive scale restoration, and they exist across every continent. And if we restored forests across those lands, we estimated that we could capture uh, an extra 205 gigatons of carbon. This, when you relate it back to the 300 gigaton problem, you can see is an absolutely incredible climate change solution. Obviously, it would take many decades to capture that 205 gigatons in the vegetation and in the soil. But immediately, particularly in the tropics where trees grow really rapidly, they'd start drawing carbon from the atmosphere. And they also start producing clouds that reflect a lot of the sun's energy and actually have a physical cooling impact. When we released this information, it was like something just clicked. And the public suddenly became interested. The, there was a media explosion for the last couple of months showing that everybody around the world was actually interested in this topic and the potential. And it meant that there was actually a huge spike in funding for restoration projects. And it resulted that we saw a huge spike in the number of projects popping up around the world. And these are just the few that we work with where they're restoring trees around the globe. There's thousands of others that we're aware of that are doing great work. But it also introduced to us some of the uglier sides of the internet in social media, where we got inundated with an insanity of messages, as you can imagine. But when you sift through that, you can see some interesting trends. And I think the first major criticism is one worth considering. That's so stupid, we can't just plant trees, we need emissions cuts. Well, I don't love the introduction to that message. In this case, I absolutely have to agree. Of course, we're not addressing climate change unless we can have technological solutions to improve our emissions. So this is absolutely correct. But the important thing to remember is they're certainly not mutually exclusive. We need emissions cuts and powerful drawdown, both done in combination. The second criticism, no, we need to conserve existing forests. Once again, it's hard to say anything other than you are absolutely correct. Of course, we see the fires in the Amazon right now. If we can have political and environmental decisions that can help that to preserve existing forests, it's going to be immensely powerful. Restoring ecosystems across the globe necessitates that we preserve what we currently have. But again, these are not mutually exclusive. It's a combined effort. And finally, it was highlighted frequently that we really need to preserve and conserve existing savannas and grasslands that are really important repositories of carbon and biodiversity. And of course, we absolutely agree. So it's difficult to disagree with any of these criticisms. Obviously, we need these ecosystems. And in fact, that was the motivation for the study, to reveal where forests can naturally go and therefore where they shouldn't, ecosystems that we shouldn't be restoring forests. 
And actually, much of our research focuses on these other ecosystem types because a holistic approach is far more powerful. But in these areas, it's not the vegetation that stores all that carbon. It's actually in the soil below our feet. So we've been building a new generation of models, not based on trees and observations of trees, but instead on thousands and thousands and thousands of soil samples collected from the ground, where we estimate how much carbon is in that soil. And again, by building machine learning models, we can generate a first quantitative understanding of the global patterns in soil carbon, revealing some really interesting trends. The high latitude regions that are cold slow down decomposition and store huge amounts of carbon. So if you're going to focus on forest restoration or above ground biomass, the tropics are your focus, focal point. But if you want to capture carbon in the soil, those high latitude regions are absolutely the places to focus, and in wetland regions as well. But again, because we've characterized where, these, where this soil carbon exists, we can also show where there's room for additional carbon. And we calculate that there's actually room for an additional 116 gigatons of carbon across the world's soils. This is another massive potential for carbon capture. And these are distributed all across the planet in forests, restoring forests, getting vegetation on the ground and preventing soil disturbance can capture 30% of that 116 gigatons. And that's just by planting trees or allowing them to regenerate. Grasslands are an incredibly component of this because they cover huge areas of the Earth's surface. And again, restoring vegetation can capture huge amounts of carbon if we prevent soil disturbance and tilling. And the nice thing about those ecosystems is that they don't come at the expense of any other land use type. So you can actually have agriculture and promote soil carbon storage both at the same time. And the most effective, efficient of those ecosystems is actually the wetlands and peatlands that's, that cover less than 10% of the world's surface, but could capture a staggering 31% of that 116 gigatons if we restore those healthy ecosystems effectively. So in combination, when we come back to that 300 gigaton problem, of course, we need to address those, those 10 gigatons we emit every year. But in natural ecosystems alone, we have the potential to draw down hundreds of gigatons of carbon with the potential to have really powerful impacts as long as it's done in an ecologically responsible way. Too many trees across the globe are restored and then die because they're pl planted in the wrong soils or in the wrong ecosystems that can't support those trees. Not only is that a waste of time and resources, but it literally can damage the ecosystems and destroy biodiversity. So we spend a huge amount of our energy generating maps that can help land managers zoom into their area of interest and see how many trees they should restore in that area or which types of species should be restored. We can even tell them which soils can support those forests or which ecosystems should be focused on. And we can even start to calculate how the heat balance will change. Because in some areas, forests have a warming effect, while in other areas, they have a cooling effect on the planet. And we can help decision making using these quantitative maps. And the other, even more important consideration is that these projects are socially responsible. It's too many projects are done by buying up a load of land, kicking out local people, and allowing forests to recover. And you'll see that those forests don't survive very long working in combination with local communities that can benefit both from the thousands of ecosystem services that forests provide, or that those ecosystems provide, but they also would benefit from the financial income associated with forest restoration. That is the only way to have truly healthy and sustainable restoration of ecosystems. So ultimately, we work with many of those projects that are doing so across the globe, and some of the best are doing so for as little as 30 cents a tree. So restoring that trillion trees could be done for as little as $300 billion if we maximized efficiency. That is nothing compared to the massive scale, the trillions of dollars that we spend every year on climate change. So this is really a climate change solution for every single one of us. We don't need to be frustrated marching around in fury. We can actually have positive and tangible impacts through three simple mechanisms. You can either plant trees yourself if you're that way inclined, and you can zoom in on our maps and see where to focus and how to have that impact. You can donate by simply going on our maps and clicking on one of the buttons where people are literally restoring trees around the world. And in this process, you can just do it with a click of a button to donate. Or you can just simply consider your investments whether you're purchasing or investing, focusing on organizations that have a positive environmental impact can be a really powerful and tangible way to impact the climate. Until now, climate action has always been about the things we can't do and the things we must give up. 
but now we also have positive actions that we can take. Which brings me to the final criticism. It sounds great, but it's just naive. We'll never restore the entire globe. And this is by far the most common one. And it's one that I don't respond to, because all I could possibly say is, no message has ever been more irrelevant. It's like saying, we can't achieve 100%, so let's give up again. It's absolutely ridiculous. Not only if, if we achieve 10% of our goals, the impacts for biodiversity and climate change will be astronomical. And I can tell you we're easily going uh, to exceed that with the tens of thousands of people that are already restoring ecosystems across the globe. I just hope the people saying it can't be done don't get in the way of the thousands of people that are already doing it. So overcoming this negative messaging remains our most important challenge. And I would draw on the words of that supervisor to say that if we just get stuck in and enjoy the challenge, not only will we literally be enjoying our time, but it's the only option we've got. We may be the first community facing the threat of climate change, but therefore we are necessarily the first society that has the chance to save the world against it. So if anybody's interested to donate to any of these projects or get involved in the movement, we're working with Bula to set up a, um, a fund that anyone can donate to very simply and easily, and it can be redistributed to any of these projects to have a really positive and tangible impact. Thank you very much.